talk about praying it forward. Praying it forward. Daniel 9, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God, and I pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God, and I confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and princes and fathers and to all the people of the land. I won't read all the words of Daniel's confession, but he goes on for several more verses praying in this same exact vein of repentance and confession. But let's jump down to the end of his prayer and then look at God's response. Look with me in verse 17, if you would, of Daniel 9. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Look at the response to his prayer in verse 20. While I was still speaking and praying and confessing, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the angel I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding as soon as you began to pray and answer. The word there is a decree. A decree was given for I have come to tell you that you are highly esteemed. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, I thank you for your people. Thank you for your presence here. Father, I thank you that everyone that's here this morning, you brought here, Father, because you have a word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make the words of God living, make them life to us. Father, I pray that someone sitting in this sanctuary would hear the answer that they need to hear today from heaven. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, there was an eager young American reporter who was assigned to the Jerusalem Bureau of his news network. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, the network put him up in an apartment that was overlooking the western wall, the wailing wall of the temple. After several weeks, he noticed an old Jewish man davening in prayer in front of the wall. And he noticed that that old man was in the same place every day, every morning, and every evening, praying fervently. And after he watched him for some time, he decided he wanted to know the man's story. He thought, maybe there's a story here. So he decided to go down and introduce himself. He said, sir, I am a reporter from the United States. I've noticed you here praying every day at this wall. What are you praying for? The old man said, every morning, I come and I pray for world peace. I pray for the brotherhood of all mankind. I pray for the end of war. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And then I go home for a while, and in the evening, I come back and I pray for the end of poverty. I pray for the end of disease. I pray for the end of suffering on earth. The reporter said to him, Sir, I'm curious. I wonder how long have you been coming to the wall to pray for these things? The old man thought and he said, How long? He said, I've been coming for more than 25 years. The reporter was amazed. He said, Sir, how does it feel if I tell you that you have been praying here at this wall for my entire lifetime. The old man looked at him and he said, how does it feel? 
it feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> I wonder if you have ever felt like you're talking to a wall when you pray. Have you ever wondered whether God is even listening? Have you ever wondered if your prayers are making any difference at all? H have you wondered if and when God might answer your prayers? If you ever have felt that way, I want to tell you that you're in the very good company of many men and women in the Bible, the ones that we now know as the heroes of faith. Perhaps the problem is not that our God is uncaring and unresponsive. Maybe the problem is that our prayers are unanswerable in their present state. James said the reason that you pray and God doesn't answer you is your prayers aren't really that great. They're selfish. They're self-promoting. They're self-gratifying. But he went on to say, if you will pray for one another, then God will answer your prayers. We're talking about praying great prayers right now. What are great prayers? For one thing, great prayers are big. They extend beyond the scope of our own little lives. They extend beyond our wishes, our wants, our personal interests, and they reach out and they make a difference in the lives of others. Great prayers are intercessory. That's just a, a fancy way of saying we pray on behalf of someone else. Great prayers are biblical. They're informed by the words of this book. They're conformed to the faith of this book. They're directed to the God of this holy book. Great prayers are benevolent. They move the heart of God because they reflect the heart of God. They're full of compassion. They're full of mercy, forgiveness. They entreat God to change his mind about people and situations. Great prayers are bold. They uh, address God directly in the confidence that comes from belonging to him. They ask God for exceptional mercy and exceptional miracles. Great prayers are beneficial. They move the hand of God. They compel God to act, to interrupt to intervene in the affairs of men. Beloved, listen, great prayers touch heaven and they make a difference on earth. We've been looking at some of the great prayers in the Bible. We looked at Abraham's prayer for Sodom. That's the first prayer of intercession in the Bible. Last week we looked at Moses' prayer in the wilderness. That's my favorite prayer of intercession. If you miss those sermons, you can catch them on our website at htchurch.com. You can get CDs of them uh, out on the Welcome Center. We even have a YouTube channel now where you can watch the video. Daniel's prayer of intercession is probably the most famous intercessory prayer in the Bible. And as I look at his prayer, I see a word about how to pray it forward. I think we're all familiar with the expression, pay it forward. But what does it mean to pray it forward? Well, to pray it forward means to faithfully carry the baton of intercession in our lifetime. It's to be faithful to the ministry of prayer today for the sake of our children and for the sake of future generations of believers. You see, what Daniel understood was that each new generation of believers depends upon the prayers of the previous generations of believers. Abraham under, uh, Dave, Daniel understood that he was standing on the shoulders of Abraham's prayers. He was standing on the shoulders of Moses' prayers and Samuel's prayers and David's prayers and Solomon and Jeremiah's prayers. Beloved, I want to tell you that you and I are the product of someone else's prayers. You see, you're here today because someone prayed for you yesterday. You belong to Jesus. You're worshiping Jesus. You're serving Jesus today because somebody prayed for you. I found out from my grandmother, who was a Baptist, that my great-great-grandmother was one of the first Pentecostals in the city of Philadelphia. 
Every Sunday morning, my great-great-grandmother would get up. She would wake my grandmother up, who was just a little girl, and she'd take her to church. Only the Pentecostal church was too wild for my grandmother, so she went to the Baptist Sunday school across the street. And after the Sunday school let out, she'd walk back across the street and sit on the front steps of the Pentecostal church for another hour and a half till they got done. I never knew my great-great-grandmother, but I know that I'm here loving Jesus today because she prayed. Can I tell you that harvest time is here today because as far back as the 1940s and the 1950s, there was a Pentecostal home prayer meeting here in Greenwich, and for a couple of decades, those spirit-filled believers prayed that one day there would be a spirit-filled church in this town. Now, every weekend, over a thousand spirit-filled believers gather here to worship. Actually, it's over 1,500 if you count our Spanish services. And we're here because they prayed. We're standing on the shoulders of their prayers. And now it's time for us to follow Daniel's lead and to pray it forward. It's time for us to carry the baton of intercession and run well the, the leg of our race so that we can pray for our children and our children's children and the future generations of believers that will worship right here. Do you know that prayer is one of the few things that you can leave your kids that they cannot squander? Do you know that statistic now is that within 17 months, kids blow the inheritance that their parents leave them. So isn't that a lovely thought? What you took your entire life to amass, your ungrateful kids are going to blow in less than a year and a half. But prayer, the Bible says, is collected in golden bowls in heaven. And those prayers continue to have effect long after you've prayed them. In fact, your prayers continue to have effect even after you're gone. Saints don't pray for people after they die and go to heaven. Saints pray for people while they're still living here on earth. And those prayers are collected in heaven and they have an effect forward into the future. What does it mean to pray it forward? To pray it forward means to deal with the issues that are holding you back today so that your children and other believers don't have to struggle with them tomorrow. It means to go to battle on your knees until you overcome the besetting sin that has plagued your family for generations. It means to deal with your junk today so that it be doesn't become your children's junk tomorrow. Think about your own life. Think about the things that you've had to struggle with, the battles that you've had to fight and win. Would you really wish those on your children? Do you want your kids to have to struggle with the same things? See, they don't have to. We can pray it forward. We can pray and we can receive insight from the Holy Spirit into what's holding us back. And then we can deal with it so that tomorrow our children can soar. That's what Daniel is doing in Daniel 9. Daniel is praying it forward. And in his prayer, I find some keys for us on how to pray it forward. And I want to share them with you. How to pray it forward. First of all, when the sands of time shift, search the word to see what God has to say about your situation. When the sands of time shift, search the word to see what God has to say about your situation. Daniel had the most amazing political career in the entire Bible. From a teenage prisoner of war, Daniel rose to be the top advisor to Nebuchadnezzar II, the king of Babylon. And he held on to that position of top advisor to the king for more than 80 years. He served under four different dictators and two world empires. He saw a lot of change in his lifetime, but his lot didn't change very much. The lot of the Jewish people didn't change very much. That entire time they were stuck as captives in Babylon. But when Daniel saw a historic shift, 
when he saw a shift in events on the world stage, when he saw a shift in power, he began to search the scriptures to see what God had to say about the situation. In the first year of Darius' reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord, that the desolation of Jerusalem would be over after 70 years. Beloved, can I tell you that now is a very good time for Christians to search the scriptures. Now is a very good time for believers to immerse ourselves in the word of God. Now is a very good time for you to know what the Bible says. We need to read other books a little less and we need to read the Bible a lot more. Now is a very good time for believers to shore up on their doctrine. Get yourself into adult Sunday school. Get yourself into our discipleship classes during the week. Make sure you're very clear about what you believe. It's a good time to memorize scripture. You see, the sands of time are shifting. Power on the world stage is shifting. And I hate to be glum this morning, but it is shifting away from America. And that has implications for us and for our children. Historic shifts are occurring among the nations that are fulfillments of biblical prophecy. Pastor Nick has started a brand new class called Things to Come on Wednesday nights. I have to tell you, this last Wednesday, it was absolutely electric in here. If you haven't had the privilege of hearing Pastor Nick teach, I want to tell you, God has blessed our congregation with one of the finest Bible teachers I have ever known anywhere, really. We, we just had an introduction, and so there's still time to jump in. But if we believe that we're living in the last days, then it would probably be a good idea to know what God has to say to believers living in the last days. See, only those who have a love for the eternal truth of the Word of God are going to make it. If you don't cling tenaciously to what the word says, you will be swept away by a torrent of unsanctified sentimentality and by seducing spirits. That's good preaching right there. When the sands of time shift, search the word to see what God has to say about the situation. And it's true for you personally too. Can I tell you, God has something to say in his word about your situation. As your years pass, as you accumulate birthdays and anniversaries, as you celebrate graduations and marriages, as you welcome babies, as you make career moves, as you have gains and suffer losses, as you experience joys and sorrows, as the sands of time shift in your life, God has something to say about your situation in every season, in every struggle, in every sickness, in every setback, in every stronghold that you encounter, God has something to say to you. Peter said, God has given us everything we need for success in life and in godliness, and it's found in the precious promises in the Word of God. There are answers in the Word for you. There is wisdom in the Word for you. There is guidance in the Word for you. There is strategic steps in the Word for you. And as you search the Word, it will ignite your prayer life. As Daniel saw things shifting on the world stage, Belshazzar was defeated in a night. The king of Babylon was having a big party, drinking out of the golden vessels that he had stolen from the temple of God. He was having a big feast, and overnight, things changed, and the Persians took over the Babylonian empire. And as Daniel saw that shift occur, he went to the word, and he found a scripture in Jeremiah 25, where God said for 70 years, Jerusalem would lay destroyed, but but when Babylon was overthrown, God would send his people back. Daniel began doing the math. He began counting the years, and he realized that it had been 68 years since he had been taken captive as a little boy out of Jerusalem. And so he began to pray earnestly. When I understood from the word that the desolation of Jerusalem was almost over, I turned to God, and I started to pray like I never prayed before. 
The word ignited his prayer life. And the word will ignite your prayer life too. Here's how. The word will give you a vision for better things that God has prepared for you. And the word will impart faith to believe for them. When Daniel read Jeremiah 25, he understood that Israel's story didn't end in Babylon. He understood that Israel's story didn't end in defeat. It didn't end in disgrace. It didn't end in captivity. It didn't end in slavery. It didn't end in exile. He read other scriptures like Deuteronomy 30 and 1 Kings 8, and he saw that God had promised better things for his people. God had promised victory and restoration. Moses had already interceded for that. Samuel had already interceded for that. David and Solomon had already interceded for that, and their prayers, Daniel knew, were still in effect. See, when you search the word, it will tell you better things about your life too. The word tells you your story doesn't end here. The word tells you your story doesn't finish this way. The word tells you you will not end beaten up by life. The word tells you you won't end up all alone. The word tells you you won't end up broken and bitter. The word tells you you won't end up captive to anxiety, captive to addictions. It'll give you a picture of better things that God has prepared for you. And you know, Jesus, your intercessor, he's already prayed for those things. And his prayers are still in effect. And not only are his prayers still in effect, he is at the right hand of the throne of God, still making intercession for you. Not only does the word give you a picture of better things ahead, but it imparts faith in your heart to believe God to deliver them. Now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word ignited Daniel's prayer life with faith. He was on his sixth decade of service. He was on his third king and his second world empire already. He had prayed facing Jerusalem three times a day through an open window for 60 years. Maybe it felt some days as if he was talking to a wall. But the word reignited faith in his prayer life. It gave him a new incentive to pray fervently and believe God for his moment of breakthrough. And the word will do the same for you. How does the word ignite your prayer life? The word will help you fight the tendency towards fatalism. It'll help you fight the tendency towards fatalism. Listen, there's something powerful. Everybody look. There's something powerful in Daniel 9, and I don't want you to miss it. When Daniel realized that he was on the cusp of fulfilled prophecy, he didn't sit back and coast. He dug in and he prayed harder. Daniel didn't take the position, well, God said after 70 years, Babylon would be overthrown, Jerusalem would be restored, so I have a nice front row seat here, and I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to watch it all go down. Daniel didn't give in to the tendency that we all have towards fatalism. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Pastor Nick sang that for us last Wednesday. If you missed it, you, you missed a treat. Maybe he'll do a reprise. But sometimes we, we, we fight that, don't we? Well, you know, it's all going to go down just like God said. It's all going to go down when God says, so I'm just going to go about my business. No, Daniel looked at the word. He realized that this was the time, and he said, I better get up. God promised after 70 years he would rebuild the city. It's been 68 already, so I better get off my seat, and I better pray like never before. The promises of God's word didn't lull him to sleep. They stirred him to pray. And the word does the same for us. Beloved, listen to me. As we find ourselves on the cusp of fulfilled Bible prophecy, it's not time to fold our arms and watch the show. It's time to dig in and pray like we have never prayed before. And when God speaks about your personal situation, 
It's not so that you can relax and do nothing. It's so that you can dig in and pray even more. You know, a couple of Sunday mornings ago, God woke me up with a dream about our phase two building. I'll share it with you in a few weeks. But I want to tell you, God didn't give me that dream to tell me to sit back and relax. God gave me that dream to signal to me that it's time for us to get up and pray and push until we break ground on that new sanctuary. The word reminds us that God has chosen to work on earth through human partners. God chose to work through Abraham. He chose to work through Joseph and Moses. He chose to work through Gideon and Deborah and Hannah and Ruth and David and Esther and Daniel. And God still uses partners today. I have news for you. As we move into the culmination of human history, you're not just along for the ride. You're part of the story. You're part of God's plan. The word reminds us that God's promises are conditional. God's promises are full of ifs and buts. If you want to lay hold of these promises, you better get up off of your, oh dear. <laughs> Uncle Mordecai told Esther, be assured, God will save his people. But if you choose to do nothing, you won't be part of that salvation. And Esther said, you know what, Uncle Mordecai, let's pray. And if you want to get in on God's promises, you better get praying too. How does the word ignite our prayer life? The word gives specific instructions for how to pray forward out of your present rut. In the scriptures, Daniel not only found promises for the future, but Daniel found a prayer pathway to the future. He found instructions in the words of Solomon. When your people have been taken captive, if they pray facing the land of Israel, facing the city of Jerusalem, facing the temple, then you will hear from heaven and you will gather them back home again. Why do you suppose that Daniel prayed three times a day in his window facing Jerusalem for 60 years and he refused to give up praying even though it meant a night in the lion's den? It's because he had received an instruction from Solomon. Daniel found instructions in the words of Moses. Even if you've been banished to the most distant land under heaven, the Lord will gather you. He'll bring you home again when you and your children return to the Lord and obey him with all your heart. Why do you suppose Daniel refused to eat the king's food that wasn't kosher? Why do you suppose that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down in front of the king's idol? It's because they had received an instruction for the future in the word of God. Daniel found instructions in the word of Jeremiah. You'll search for me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And after 70 years, I will gather you again and I'll bring you home for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. That's why Daniel got down on his face in Daniel 9 and he prayed like he had never prayed before. The word showed Daniel how to pray. In fact, all Daniel did was simply pray the word back to God. And the word will show you how to pray too. One of the keys of answered prayer is to pray in alignment with God's will. This book is always in alignment with God's will. So when you pray the scripture back to God, you can be assured that you're praying in alignment with his will. And prayer will push you out of the rut you've been stuck in. And it will push you forward into God's future. How to pray it forward. Search the word. Second, pray it forward by putting the past behind you, by putting it in front of God. Put the past behind you by putting it before God. Based on what Daniel learned in the word, he prayed one of the most powerful prayers of confession in the entire Bible. Only David's prayer of confession in Psalm 51 rivals this one. Daniel pulls out all the stops in his confession. He says, God, we have sinned. 
We have done wrong. We have been wicked. We have rebelled. We've turned away. We've not listened. We've refused to obey. We've been unfaithful. We haven't kept your commands. We've transgressed. We've not turned away from our sin. We are covered in shame because of our iniquities. Out of 16 verses in this prayer, 13 of them are full of confession. Daniel learned from the word that in order to move forward into God's future, it's necessary to deal with your past in prayer. Specifically, prayers of repentance. Beloved, can I tell you that repent is the first word of the gospel of the kingdom. Repent is the first word of Jesus' teaching and preaching ministry. It's the first abiding quality in the heart of citizens of the kingdom. Repent was Peter's first instruction on the day of Pentecost. Repentance is the first necessary step to truly putting your past behind you. When it comes to the sins of your past, when it comes to the failures of your past, when it comes to the conflicts and the broken relationships of your past, you can't put them behind you simply by trying to put them out of your mind. There is no forgetting in the Bible until you seek God's forgiveness. You can't let bygones be bygones until your guilt is all gone. You can't bury the hatchet until you've been buried and raised again with Christ. It's not water under the bridge until your conscience has been cleansed by the pure water of God's forgiveness. If we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just. And listen to me, there's a word for somebody in this house today. If you're stuck in the present, perhaps it's due to an unresolved problem in your past. Maybe you need to repent. Sometimes we go around rebuking the devil. It's all the devil's fault when our real problem is that God is rebuking us. The first step to the road to recovery is acknowledging and confessing our sin. We deal with that on Tuesday evenings in our ministry called Pathway to Recovery. We have new Pathways groups that are forming right now. And if you want to be part of a group, you can contact Pastor Faith in the church office and she'll help you get connected on Tuesday nights. But Daniel shows us that repentance is a product of sincere sorrow. Repentance is directed towards God. And listen, repentance is specific. Daniel confesses at least 12 different ways that Israel sinned, and he cites specific occasions that they sinned, and we need to do the same. You know, sometimes people ask me, Pastor, do I need to repent for every sin that I've ever committed? And my answer is this, you need to repent for everyone that the Holy Spirit brings to your remembrance while you're praying. Jesus taught us that repentance is an abiding quality in a believer's heart. He taught that repentance is part of our ongoing prayer life. Remember, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. David prayed about it this way, search me, O God. Know my heart, test my thoughts, examine my ways, see if there be any wicked thing in me, and lead me forward in the path of eternal life. I believe that that needs to be part of our daily prayer life. I believe that God will answer that prayer. He may bring some specific things to your mind, things that you have long ago forgotten or that you have long since moved on from, but it's holding you back right now until you bring it and you put it before God in confession and in repentance. Daniel also learned from the word that in order for your family to move forward into God's future, it's necessary for you to deal with your family's past in prayer. Listen, I'm going to give you a tweetable line right now. Intercessors take action in the present, confessing the sins of the past for the sake of God's family in the future. That's good preaching right there. Intercessors take action in the present, confessing the sins of the past for the sake of God's family in the future. 
In order to pray forward the next generation of believers, Daniel used the powerful spiritual weapon called identificational repentance. That's a million dollar word right there. And if you want to write me a million dollar check for phase two, I'll explain it to you. <laughs> identificational repentance. What does that mean? What that means is that Daniel repented for the sins of others as if they were his sins. Now, that's remarkable when you think about Daniel's unwavering faithfulness in Babylon. This was the man whose life was so squeaky clean that when his enemies were trying to manipulate him, they could find nothing on him. They could find no skeleton in his closet. They could find no dirt on him. So the only recourse they had was to make prayer illegal because that was the only way they could catch this man in a crime. What's the charge against Daniel? Unlawful prayer. And yet, look at the intercession of this squeaky clean man. God, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have been wicked. We have rebelled. We have turned away from you. He prayed for the sins of others as if they were his sins. And when we pray for others' sins... As if they're our sins. It changes the way we pray about them completely. Have you been paying attention to what's happening in Colorado? They illegalized marijuana last year. Yeah, maybe that wasn't such a good move. Half the state burned down, and now the rest of the state has washed away in floods. There's hundreds of people missing. Uh, Pastor Nick's son is there in Fort Carson. We need to pray for Nikki. My cousins live there in Colorado. You know, when we talk about the sins of other people, it's very easy to be cavalier. Oh, yeah, God, let fire fall from heaven on those heathens. But when we're talking about my sin, I'm going to beg God for mercy. And when we pray for others' sins as if they were our sins, it changes how we pray about them. Rather than praying down fire from heaven, we pray, God, be merciful. God, be compassionate. God, turn your anger away and forgive. That's the way that we need to pray for the church. That's the way that we need to pray for America. Not, oh God, look what they've done now. But, oh God, what have we done? Daniel repented for the sins of past generations as if they were his responsibility. He said, God, forgive my sin, forgive our sins and the iniquities of our fathers. Iniquity is sin that is hidden deep inside the human heart. It's sin that becomes enmeshed in someone's character, in someone's personality, their identity. It is unconfessed, unforgiven, unbroken sin. God said that the sins of the fathers will be visited on their children to the third and the fourth generation. That means the sins that your fathers committed and the sins that their fathers committed will affect you today and your children tomorrow unless you deal with them in repentance. The way to do that is to confess the sins of your past generations, renounce them, and take authority in the name of Jesus and break the strongholds that they've left off of your family. You can learn how to do that in the class we offer called Cleansing Stream. Just started a brand new session of Cleansing Stream on Wednesday nights. It's a pretty short class. So if you wanted to get in and learn how to do what I'm talking about this week, this Wednesday would be your last chance to jump in. But you can learn how to do that. Some of the sins of my past generations are addiction. Alcoholism runs rampant in both sides of my family. Racism, anti-Semitism. My mother's father had a swastika that he hung over their fireplace in their family room. My father's family was heavy into Freemasonry. In their secret vows, Masons actually pronounce curses over the future generations of their family if they fail to keep the faith of masonry. 
You see, I don't want any of that junk affecting me today, and I definitely don't want it affecting my kids tomorrow, so I'm going to take responsibility, and I'm going to deal with it in repentance. The prayers that my great-great-grandmother prayed for me in Philadelphia a hundred years ago, I'm now going to pray forward for the sake of my children and their children and the future generations of my family. God visits the sins of the guilty on the third and the fourth generation, but he shows love to a thousand generations of those who love him and who keep his commandments. And what we do for the sake of our own families, God also wants us to do for the sake of his family. We can pray forward the next generation of believers by taking responsibility in repentance today. How to pray it forward. Search the word. Put the past behind you by putting it before God. And finally this. Pray through until you receive the rewards of intercession. Pray through until you receive the rewards of intercession. Praying through is an old Pentecostal expression. It means to pray and to keep on praying until God sends the answer, until God lifts the burden. Daniel prayed through until the time of the evening sacrifice. That means on this particular day he had been praying anywhere between three and six hours. Now, don't let that intimidate you if you're just starting out. He worked up to that over 60 years, okay? He, he worked up to that prayer stamina. If you're not quite there, start out with 10 or 15 minutes, and God will help you grow in your prayer life. But Daniel kept praying until God sent an answer. And we need to do the same. Jesus taught us to pray and to never give up. And here are a few rewards of intercession. First of all, identificational repentance brings a swift reply of mercy from God. While Daniel was still praying, while he was still confessing, while he was still on his face pouring his heart out to God, Gabriel showed up all out of breath. He said, I got here as fast as I could. As soon as you started praying, Daniel, God issued a decree. Can I tell you that reminds us something beautiful about God. He is slow to get angry. He is slow to punish sin. But he is swift to forgive us when we turn and come back to him. Identificational repentance heals the strained relationship between you and God and your family and God. Identificational repentance breaks the stronghold of iniquity off of your family line. It reverses generational curses and it releases God's blessings on your future. Identificational repentance secures a second chance and a new beginning for you. Daniel 9 ends with the vision of 70 weeks. If you want to understand that vision fully, then you need to come to Pastor Nick's class on Wednesday nights and he'll explain it to you. But quickly, let me tell you that God is offering his people a second chance here. God is saying you blew it for the last 490 years under the monarchy, but I'm going to give you another 490 years and this time it's going to end differently because I'm going to send you my son and he's going to pay the price for sin and he's going to establish his kingdom and he's going to reign over you forever and ever and ever. Beloved, listen, when you repent, God offers you a second chance. And this time the story is going to end differently because Jesus is now in the equation. Identificational repentance causes God to issue a decree over you and your family. Listen, every decree, every decree made by an earthly leader has behind it a spiritual decree. Before Cyrus issued his decree to send the Jews home, before he issued the decree to rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem, God had already issued a decree in the heavenly realm in response to the intercession of Daniel. 
See, it might feel some days like you're talking to a wall. It might feel some days like you're not, God, we're not making any progress here. We're not, I've been praying and there's no change in my children. There's no change in my marriage. There's no change in my finances. There's no change in my health. God, it doesn't seem like I'm getting anywhere. But the angel told Daniel, as soon as you started praying, God sent the answer on the way to you. Listen, you don't know what's happening while you're praying while you're in your pup tent there is a battle raging in the heavenly realm on your behalf someday when we go to heaven we're going to sit down and swap stories with the angels and they're going to let us know what was happening in the air around us while we were praying while you're in your pup tent praying God is issuing royal proclamations about you and about your family when we gather together as believers and we pray here God is issuing proclamations in the realm of the spirit about us that's pretty good right there I'm making myself happy I'm gonna I'm gonna preach I'm gonna start speaking in tongues pray through until you receive the rewards of intercession gotta go fast intercession carves out pockets of mercy for God's people in times of social upheaval disasters and wars beloved listen Things are going to go down just as God said. They're going to unfold just when God determines them to unfold. But you and I need to be in prayer so that God will preserve us and he'll preserve our families. Intercession will determine how you fare when it's on like Donkey Kong. Intercession releases angelic hosts to come to you. Guardian angels are sent to you. Warrior angels are sent to you. Ministering angels are sent to renew your strength. Messenger angels are sent to you bearing specific instructions from the Word of God. Listen, this is a living book. God is still doing the same things He has always done. Intercession makes you highly esteemed in the eyes of God. Gabriel told Daniel, God sent me because you are highly esteemed, Daniel. The, those words literally mean a, a treasured possession. And how many of you know God is not about to let go of his treasured possession? He's not allow, about to let anybody touch his treasured possession. Intercession will move the hearts of fearsome and godless dictators to have inexplicable mercy on you and God's people. Intercession will cause the favor that was on Abraham and Isaac in Abimelech's house to fall on you. Intercession will cause the favor of God that was on Jacob in Laban's fields to rest on you. Intercession will cause the favor that was on Joseph in Egypt to rest on you. It will cause the favor that was on Ruth in Boaz's fields to rest on you. I speak over you three weeks of provision in a single day and a year's provision in, a, in, a, in three months' time. Intercession will cause the favor that was on David in the Philistine camp to fall on you. The favor that was on Esther and Mordecai. The favor that was on Nehemiah and Ezra. The favor that was on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The favor that was on Daniel in Babylon. It will rest on you. Pray through until you receive the rewards of intercession. Finally this. Intercession prevails on God to finish the good work he began in you. Now, O oh Lord, our God, you brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You made a name for yourself among the nations. You put your name on Jerusalem. You put your name on the holy hill. You put your name on the temple. Because of your great mercy, O oh God, listen, forgive, hear, and act. Do not delay because we, your people, we bear your name. I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in your family, he be who began a good work in your uh, marriage, in your relationships, in your house, he will bring it through to completion. Search the word. 
put the past behind you by putting it before God and pray through until you receive the rewards of an intercessor. Now you know how to pray it forward. Stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, let's give him a great big praise. Hallelujah. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Listen, I just really feel to say this from the Holy Spirit this morning. Some of you, I want you to just this week in prayer, I want you to go back and just simply pray and say, Lord, if there's anything in my past, if there's anything in my family's past that's holding me back right now or holding my kids back right now, I want you to just show me so that I can just confess it, renounce it, break the power of it. It's really very simple. And I believe the Holy Spirit, I think that there's somebody stuck today and, and this is the key and the Lord's just going to help you. I want you to take your Bibles if you have them and I want you to just hold them up if you would. Some of you use your Bible on your iPhone and, and uh, I know you, but if you have your Bible, listen, you should have a hard copy of the Bible. So, you know, the switch that controls the internet could go off one morning and, and you need to have a paper backup, all right? So you need to hide it in your heart. I want you to hold your Bible up. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that this would be a week of profound revelation in the Word. I pray, God, that you would breathe life to your people. All Scripture is God-breathed. The breath of God blows out of the pages of the Bible. I pray, God, that when we open this book, Lord, that there would be a breath of life that just blows into our nostrils, that quickens our spirit. God, I pray that you'd quicken us as we search the word. Lord, I pray that you'd speak answers, Lord, to our marriages. I pray you'd speak answers for our kids. I pray that you'd speak answers for our finances. I pray that you'd speak answers for our health. I pray that you'd show us pictures of better things. And I pray, Father, that you would show us pathways in prayer, Lord, to lead to the fulfillment, the acquisition of the things that you've promised and spoken. God, I pray pray that reading the Bible this week wouldn't be dry, dusty, boring. I pray, God, that you'd increase our capacity right now in Jesus' name, Lord, to receive from your word. I pray you'd increase our capacity to understand. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that it wouldn't be dry, boring, dull. I pray that it would be alive. I pray, Lord, that we would see things we've never seen before. I pray you'd anoint our eyes with eyes salve, Lord, just to see things in the scripture that we never saw before. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us revelation about how to move forward ourselves and how to move forward for our kids and our future generations. I wonder very quickly, you'd just pray that prayer of David with me, asking God for revelation. Would you pray? I'm going to lead and you follow. If you're willing, just repeat after me. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test my thoughts. Examine my ways. See if there be any wicked thing in me. And lead me forward in the path of eternal life. Let me pray for you. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that this would be a week of revelation about iniquity, Lord, that has strong, had strongholds over generations of our family. Lord, I pray that you would show us. I pray, Lord, that we would happen upon information about our relatives, our ancestors, Lord, our fathers, their fathers, their fathers, things that we never realized we didn't know. And I pray, Father, as we turn to you in prayer, that you'd be swift to answer in mercy. I pray that the strongholds of iniquity would be broken off of our families, Lord. Father, I pray that generational curses would be reversed. I feel like there's a, a generational curse of a skin disorder 
and I feel like God's going to show it to you. And as you just uh, put it before God, I feel like uh, he's going to even answer and he's gonna, there's going to be a dramatic healing of a skin condition that has been passed down through a couple generations of your family. Father, let it be now in Jesus' name. Lift up your hands. Father, I pray that the rewards of an intercessor would fall on us. Let the favor of Daniel in Babylon fall on us. God, I pray this would be a week of advance. I pray it would be a week of breakthrough. I pray it would be a week of answered prayer. I pray for everybody in this church who needs a job. I pray for a job and I pray for better jobs, Lord. I pray for promotions, Lord. I pray for pay raises. I pray for bonuses. I pray, Lord, for sales and commission. I pray for our small business owners that you'd profoundly bless their businesses. I pray for new clients. I pray for accounts receivable to be paid in full, Lord. I pray that your blessing would be on your people to buy low and sell high this week, Lord. I pray the last quarter of this year would be the most fruitful and productive that your people have seen in years and years, Lord. I pray, God, that there would be three weeks of provision in a single day and a year's worth of provision released in three months' time. Father, Lord, I pray the blessings of God on your people in a profound way in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. Listen, this is going to be our benediction. Hug two or three people. Tell them it's going to be a great week and bless them in the name of the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you this week.